Heavenly Father, we ask for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion, allow us to grow closer as a group, and nurture the bonds of community. Fill us with your grace as we make decisions that might affect the students, staff, faculty, and parents of Southwest ISD. And continue to remind us that all that we do here today and all that we accomplish is for the pursuit of the truth of the greater glory of you and for the service of humanity. We ask these things in your name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the Republic for which it stands. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas or the state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Yes, what I'd like to do, uh, uh, just a reminder, board members, uh, we're doing this meeting uh, in face to face. Uh, practicing social distancing so we're allowed to do this meeting uh, but uh, our guests uh, are uh, tuning in virtually and so I'll ask you to check your mic if your mic is on green uh, that allows our guests who are uh, attending the meeting virtually uh, to be able to hear uh, all of them. And so we do have recognitions uh, this evening first of all welcome to this May 19th board meeting uh, this is a traditional time where we get to meet uh, some of our students who at the uh, Coming at the end of their high school experience, I've done some uh, pretty uh, phenomenal academic things and uh, are going on to do really great things. And so we get to meet uh, our balance and our styles in each one of our high schools. And I know we have our high school principals represented here this evening. Uh, and because of this uh, school interruption, moving to emergency virtual um, format, we did not get to meet our teachers of the year. Uh, who are really the folks behind the students like that uh, who are, are just uh, phenomenal in their own right? And so after that, we get to meet some of our teachers of the year as well. So I will turn it over to Mr. Magnus. Uh, I think he's going to start uh, with our relevance and I'll enjoy those introductions this evening. Thank you, Dr. Verstuff. We're actually going to kick it off with our teachers of the year. And with us to announce that recognition, we have Selena Madrigal. Selena? Thank you, Janice. Um, yes, yeah, so we're going to kick it off with Teachers of the Year tonight. Um, tonight, we would like to recognize our 2019-2020 Southwest ISD Teachers of the Year. Their enthusiasm for teaching, their love for children, and their expertise make them teachers that are highly respected and admired among their peers and within this great community. We thank them for all that they do, and this recognition tonight is just a small token of that appreciation. So we do have a little presentation for you guys um, to, to be able to kind of see each one of them and their faces and put kind of a face to a name. Uh, so we're gonna start off first here with Big Country Elementary School. We have Miss Audrey English Gompa. She is their Campus Teacher of the Year. Continuing on with our Campus Teachers of the Year, we have Elm Creek Elementary School, Miss Maritza Jaramillo. We have Hidden Cove Elementary School, Miss Leonor Gallegos, Crewald Road Elementary, Andres Sutherland Trevino, Meadow Creek Elementary, Kelly Xavier, Sun Valley Elementary, Amy Torres, Southwest Elementary, Alma Strelnikova, Spicewood Park Elementary, Denise Patel. McAuliffe Middle School, Roger Garcia. 
McNair Middle School, Mitchell Kelly. Scobie Middle School, Stacy Darden. And our Crossroads Center, William Hardiman. Southwest High School, we have Julie Kruger. And those are our Campus Teachers of the Year. We're now gonna go through our elementary district finalists. First, we have Bob Hope Elementary School, Jessica Torres. And we have Indian Creek Elementary School, Carlos Perez. For our secondary district finalists, we have Resnick Middle School, Jorge Frosto, and Cast Dem, James Quintana. Now for our district teachers of the year, elementary district teacher of the year for 2019 and 2020, we have Sky Harbor Elementary School, Miss Brenda Trejo. And last but not least, for our secondary district teacher of the year for 2019, 2020, we have Miss Samantha Arnold for Southwest Legacy High School. So a big congratulations to all of our Although we could not celebrate our Teachers of the Year in person, we did want to ensure that they still re receive the recognition that they deserve. So last week, all of our Teachers of the Year were delivered a personalized yard sign for them to display with pride. These are some of the photos that you saw throughout this presentation. They also received a personalized Southwest ISD journal, a personalized Teacher of the Year shirt, and the traditional Teacher of the Year stipend from the district. So just a big congratulations to all of them once again. Thank you. So we know our Teachers of the Year are probably tuned in. They, they can't answer, but we want to let them know that we're very proud of them. We congratulate them. Uh, we're sorry that it's a non-traditional type of year uh, but nonetheless uh, educators of excellence are always uh, applauded and uh, great job well done everyone thank y'all so much and thank you for putting together the presentation thank you sir up next we have our student recognition so a great honor to meet our top two students for each campus who are actually joining us as well today on this uh, live virtual board meeting. So let's get started with our presentation as well. The first, uh, the first student that we want to recognize is our Southwest High School salutatorian, and it is Hannah Verstuff. Congratulations, Hannah. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Southwest High School would like to recognize Hannah Versta as the salutatorian of, for the class of 2020. Hannah is a well-rounded young lady who stands out amongst her peers and a proudly attended Southwest Elementary and McNair Middle School. She has been a recipient of the A Honor Roll Award, part-time honors recipient with Palo Alto College and Superintendent Scholar Summit Award for the past four years. She will be graduating with the STEM endorsement and multidisciplinary endorsement as a distinguished graduate. Hannah has taken numerous advanced academic courses and will have earned a total of 57 college hours. Hannah was an elite academic all-state team recipient, a four-year varsity volleyball letterman, and probably served as the co-captain her senior year. Hannah was a member of the National Honor Society and served as the NHS president. She also served as a leader on the Superintendent Advisory Council for the past four years. She is the recipient of the Alamo Bowl Scholarship and has volunteered numerous hours at the Children's Hospital. Who, what she will remember most about Southwest ISD are the friends she has made and the amazing teachers she encountered who genuinely cared about her. Her future plans are to attend the University of Texas at Austin to study public health in hopes to go to med school to become a ped pediatric surgeon. Congratulations, Hannah. <laughs> Next up, we have our Southwest High School valedictorian, Morgan Fay. Morgan's resilience, positivity, and eagerness to challenge herself shows in classroom and on the field. Morgan proudly attended Elm Creek Elementary and McNair Middle School. She has been a recipient of the A Honor Roll 
Award, part-time honors recipient with Palo Alto College and Superintendent Summer Scholar Summit Award for the past four years. She will be graduating with a STEM endorsement and multidisciplinary endorsement as a distinguished graduate. Morgan has taken numerous advanced academic courses and will have earned a total of 57 college hours. Morgan is a four-year varsity track letterman. She was an academic all-state first team recipient for 2020. She is the 5A 2019 state champion for discus and placed third in the 5A 2019 shot putt event. She holds the school record for both events. She's a member of the National Honor Society where she served as the NHS vice president. Morgan also served as a leader on the superintendent advisory council for the past four years. She is the recipient of a full ride athletic scholarship to Rice University. What she will remember most about Southwest ISD is our great community and how amazing is to see them at our events. Her future plans are to attend Rice University to study kinesiology and neuroscience. Congratulations, Morgan. <laughs> Up next, we have our Southwest Legacy High School salutatorian, Arlie DeLuna. Arlie will finish with a 4.21 GPA on the Distinguished Graduation Plan. Arlie also participates in mariachi and dance. In dance, according to her dance teacher, Arlie was a natural talent. She tried out and made the varsity golden dancer of dance team her senior. She, has a caring she was a caring student and helped team members when needed. She was a responsible student in maintaining eligibility in multiple organizations. She tried her best to split her time equally between each organization. She was a part of many awards when she participated in two UIL dance competitions this year. She was a great role model and representative of the 2019-2020 Golden Dancer Dance Team. Harley is a phenomenal student who is very goal-oriented and dedicated to everything she does. She is a student who constantly strives for perfection and is very humble in her demeanor. Harley will truly be missed. Congratulations, Harley. And last but not least, we have our Southwest Legacy High School valedictorian, Megan Marquez. <laughs> Southwest Legacy High School would like to recognize Megan Marquez and part of the second, as part of the second graduating class at Southwest Legacy High School. Megan will graduate on the Distinguished Graduation Plan with a 4.23 GPA. One of Megan's biggest accomplishments is placing second in Palo Alto speech competition in the 11th grade. What Megan will remember most about her experience at Southwest Legacy High School is the people she met. Megan states, the people made the school great. Everyone from friends, teachers, and staff all worked together to make Legacy a great place to learn. This outstanding student who truly excels in the classroom will attend Texas A&M San Antonio and major in biology with a concentration in zoology or ecology. Megan states, I would like to do something I am passionate about, which is contributing to the efforts at wildlife conservation and protecting our fragile environments. Megan is a great student who truly made a difference at Legacy High School. Congratulations, Megan. So can they hear us? Can you guys hear us, Mark? They can hear you. Oh, very good. So I, I, I think we everyone can take their turn to congratulate. We just want to say congratulations uh, to end up in the top two students at both of our high schools. It is really a remarkable feat, and you should be very proud of yourselves. Uh, definitely an indication and validation of your hard work uh, and the potential you have in the future. And uh, even though you're going to graduate, you're starting a new journey. And so we wish all of you well. Uh, in your new journey when you go to college and university and uh, then beyond that to career. So congratulations to all four of you. And I, I noticed, and I'm sure everyone else that they're all female. Yes. It's <laughs> real power. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anyone else wants to congratulate them. Congratulations. So thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, was that all of our recognitions? 
Okay. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you. That wraps up our recognitions. Very good. I'll see all of you in a few weeks. And congratulations to your principal. Uh, we're here as well, Mr. Black, Mr. Giddy. So that concludes our recognition, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, has anybody signed up to do this? I I'm Yes, I'll be pretty brief on our projects right now. We have uh, currently right now we have four active ongoing projects. The first one being Southwest High School Renovation Phase 3. Uh, on that one, the contractor has actually started uh, working on the project. I know they've had several meetings with staff. And they started selective demolition in the building in preparation for the replacement of the 12 units that are scheduled to be replaced this first summer. Um, the crane is supposed to come in on Friday. So you'll see a crane behind uh, Southwest High School in preparation again to remove uh, the 12, 12 of the 40 units that are going to be removed as part of phase three. Um, but that's pretty much the quick and uh, fast version of phase three. I don't know if you guys have any questions in terms of phase three. For uh, the roof, the re-roof and HVAC, FA Nunley was selected. They're already sending out submittals, again, in preparation to uh, replace all the units in four of our campuses, as well as install the HVAC systems in all of our 11 elementaries. One thing we did meet about last week is FA Nunley is going to be very aggressive this first summer. Originally, our schedule uh, told them to account for four schools or four elementaries this first summer. They want to tackle at least eight elementaries this summer, as well as uh, McCullough's roof and Indian Creek's roof um, on the first summer. They want to really front load this portion of the project, complete it. That way, the second summer, there's a lot less to be done while still trying to do as much as they can throughout the school year. But that's pretty much it on, on the update for the re-roof projects. For the natatorium, we're continuing with meetings with the city, meetings with uh, team members. I know Ms. Uh, Coach Wagner has been involved in several of them, um, and meetings with city and code officials in preparation for the full-on plan submittal. I know all of the architects are eager to come and present to you. I'm probably not doing any justice to, to all the work that they've uh, put in, but they're really going ahead and we're set for the natatorium to bid out fully on GNP at the end of October and break around very shortly after. So, And for SCOBY uh, is the presentation I have here for you guys. And this is fairly quickly. We had um, Bartlett Hawk was selected and they jumped in extremely fast. Uh, we provided drawings to them, they submitted their original pricing. So this presentation is really to give you guys what the update is on, on the pricing. Everything that was base bid, base bid, excuse me, is included, very similar to McAuliffe exterior lighting, entrance upgrade, all classroom renovations, floor ceilings, uh, lighting, paint. Uh, we also have a couple of alternates that we included. But the good news that Bartlett Cobb brought in to us if I can put in is everything that's base bid that we wanted to include and that includes everything that was notified or included in the bond language or less um, than our projected budget so we're under 200,000 on SCOBY's renovation the way it's tracking right now um, the ad alternates do add uh, to roughly 
send me an active campus. We're going to be bringing three of the portables that are currently in Macaulay north of the site closest to our uh, future auditorium. So those three portables will be transported to Scobie Middle School behind on the field in the back of the school. Uh, that will allow all the school really to take a lot of uh, an entire wing at a time for renovation. But that's pretty much the update in terms of construction. I don't know you guys. Will the construction start irrespective if the kids are in the buildings or not? Yes, or right now, or both? at this point, we're, we're planning to go as a schedule was on the kids are coming out on this. Um, if something changes their awareness, they can, they can adjust. So. Yeah, we, we, will, we, we will study that. It will affect all our construction projects and timelines, depending on what happens in the fall. We're going to take a hard look at that. Uh, and plan as we are coming back to normal and adjust and be flexible. But they know uh, the possibilities that could possibly happen. It would be nice to see a big hole over there. Yes, sir. Right, well, that, that, no matter where we come back in fall or not, that's not going to happen until fall, the end of October, 1st of November, sorry, on the natatorium. Oh. Yeah, because they're going to go through a whole pricing phase. Uh, me too, sir. I wish you were here tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. We're, last year we were tracking about 94% collection at this time. We're a little bit below 93, so we're a little bit less. All right. My name is Joe, and you investment gifts, enrollment. Uh, stop me if you have questions. Purchases over 50000 Voice on the high school schedule. Just turn on to uh, Joanne, but you guys recall when the brown bag, uh, when uh, Brandon was doing the finance presentation, we know the territory that we're heading toward for the next couple of years after this next school year is going to be extreme uh, wheat bill. It's going to be extreme revenue uh, challenges and obstacles uh, for school districts, and so we really want to. Direction and one of the, the items that Brandon presented on was a seven period day uh, as a cost saving measure, uh, but uh, something that we're very familiar with. And we know a lot of the majority of high schools uh, already have uh, in their school district. And so, one of the questions raised uh, by our trustees was how do students feel about that? So, to answer the opportunity to uh, work with staff and together survey and get to so thank you. Um, we did put out a survey. Uh, probably didn't get the response uh, numbers that we would like, but they did get some responses. And I want to thank uh, Joseph and Paul for, for making sure we put out many surveys recently. And so uh, I'm sure our kids are inundated with them. And so we did do, um, sorry, I have this in a PDF format. Um, we did do a survey. Uh, we had 231 responses. We did put it out to parents, students, and teachers. Um, the request tonight was on um, what our students felt about the, the schedule. And so that's going to be the data that we share. If you want other data on what parents, um, parents want, uh, what their data is, or teachers, I'd be more than happy to provide that to you by email to the board. Um, student responses, we had over 160 responses. Um, you can see there the breakup. We had uh, students that were rising seniors, uh, students that were uh, rising juniors, um, sophomores, and obviously our freshmen, our, our eighth graders, probably weren't sure whether they should respond or not. And so that's the breakdown of that. So I think it's a pretty good mix of upperclassmen and how they felt about the schedule. Um, we asked very specific questions. Uh, with the current five-period five period day, 90 minutes per period, how do you feel the class time is used? You can see here uh, in blue at about 17%, the same amount of instruction and learning could be done with time. 45% uh, of the kids said some instruction, some learning, and some free time. Uh, thir about 30% said instruction and learning most of the 90 minutes. And then about 8-9% uh, said instruction and learning will be in turn. So, um, sorry, I hit the wrong button. So um, students prefer getting information in longer segments. Um, how does the current schedule of five periods per day, 90 minutes per period, impact your learning preferences? 
Um, about 57% of them said it's, it's about just right. I prefer getting information in longer segments. Uh, about 43% of them said it's too much time. I prefer instruction in smaller segments. So, um, not probably not significant enough of, of a difference, but definitely a difference. Uh, students prefer five period, nine minute classes. Uh, if given the choice, which time schedule would you prefer? And I think this is about equal. Uh, we have 47.5% of the kids said that they would prefer a traditional seven period day, 50 minutes each. Um, and the current five periods, 90 minutes, we had about 53, like roughly about 53 percent. And so, um, sorry. Um, students feel that either option will allow them to take the classes they want. Um, I feel like a seven period day will allow me to take the classes I want. Um, 50, about 51 percent, I feel like I get to take all the classes I want in the five period day. And so that is the data on student voice. Um, I believe that we have met as a senior group uh, repeatedly over the past couple. Um, I believe the decision is, is obviously if you want to get more other information we'd love to do that. Um, so we have to stick with a seven period schedule um, moving forward into next year. I'd like to make some I have some thoughts and some comments I would like to share with you guys. I know we've gone back and forth with the block scheduling and seven period thing over the last decade. And it seems to me that um, our tendency is that when um, we have a little bit of extra money that the route that we go is to do the block schedule. And when we have budget constraints, we go back to the seven period. So I feel like like what happens is that we prefer and like the block scheduling more, but we every time that money becomes an issue, we you know our reflex is to go to save money there. Okay. So I wanted to make a couple of comments about that. You know, first of all, I would like to see that decisions get made that impact students most directly, that the budget decisions that do that be the last decisions that we make, right? After we, you know, you know, there's other areas that we can go back on, on you know, with money and budgets, etc. So I also feel like this particular decision impacts a lot of kids. You know, four to five thousand kids are going to be affected by this decision, and you know, and how they learn and where they learn. And I'm going to go back to the presentation y'all made to us when you wanted to go to block, block scheduling, which was that building relationships the single most important thing that we do every day with our kids, and that the seven period uh, day is more rushed. You know, it's there's not a lot of time, so you know the teachers don't get the opportunity to spend the time that they need with the kids. So it's going to affect that. It also, the block scheduling is a better, uh, you told us that the, the block scheduling is better for project learning, collaborative learning. Um, you also told us that uh, teachers would have more time to differentiate within their classrooms and that the kids would be able to team, to, to, to team, uh, do project learning together easier and better with the block scheduling. So, um, so I just, you know, wanted to bring those things up. Um, and if we're going to affect students directly, maybe we can impact programs or we can talk about programs that are more expensive and affect less children. Because I know we've got, we're doing some things, on, you know, that are, you know, that are very pricey and affect, you know, a few hundred kids, two, three hundred kids, four hundred kids. And uh, maybe we should talk about those projects before we talk, talk about the project that could potentially affect almost 5,000 kids. I just wanted to um, share those thoughts with y'all. I, I, I didn't realize y'all were having the conversations already and had pretty much come to a decision. If I would have realized that, I would have shared that with you earlier. But um, I also wanted to see what the, what the survey would bring back. Yeah, no doubt what your, your comments are, are hit on. I mean, there's no doubt. Um, we know that when we're going in the future, this is a direction that We've never been uh, at the level of what we think are going to be the budget cuts in the future. Uh, that we're going to be forced to anyway, are we forced next year? Probably not. Uh, if you ask some teachers, I think they would say the traditional schedule is a more preferred schedule. Uh, our students were in better chunks. Uh, I think the majority of teachers, and principals can correct me, the majority of teachers would rather teach a lot. We 
we teach in a block we have less passing minutes every day in the hallway. Uh, so that's kind of one structure of mind that, that kind of goes away and adds up as you uh, go through 180 days of instruction. And so uh, there's no job when you say, I, I, I think there are, if people can afford to stay in blocks, uh, I think most districts would want to teach in that type of format. Um, I'm just, I think what we're trying to do is we know we're going to end up here. Let's get in here and, and, and try to make it uh, as good as we can. There's no doubt that your comments aren't like you know, we did say those things. I think, it, and then I think at some point you guys had even talked about a hybrid scheduling where, you know, maybe like the English, math, social studies were in block right. and the electives were in the one hour or there were other alternatives. I just, Which is what exactly what we're going to do with the second period today. We're going to block English 1, English 2. Uh, we know literacy and foundation literacy uh, is the most important thing that we can do for kids to learn. You can read, you can comprehend. Uh, so we're still going to keep some hybrid to it, uh, even if we go to the traditional schedule. Um, how much money is it that we're going to save going to the well, We're not going to have to cut any positions. So back then when, uh, when this was produced, this book took five every day, the, the expectation was that they could do it within budget. They didn't have to add staff. Right. Uh, it wasn't going to affect any programs that going to affect funding to other programs that inevitably come to fruition. And so we struggled with a staff model to really support the schools on, because since they went to this model, we weren't able to come up with what they actually really need. So we put it out on paper on a five period day, we should actually give them more staff. We just didn't do that because the previous administration, which the two principals here are weren't the ones that came up with a schedule and said that you make it happen. Now they're facing, like, legacies of growing campus with extra students. How many teachers do we really need to give them based on the models that we have in place? And so the models that we had in place were adding 12, 14 teachers. We didn't do that. So we didn't take on that expense, but it's put a strain on them and their master schedule and the things that you had to work through. Uh, so uh, moving forward, so a legacy now, we still have to add teachers at legacy they, have, they actually have more students than Southwest High School, but now we use the seven period day model, it's not as impactful as it would have been. When we went to the block schedule, it did affect a lot of the career and technology things. I remember it was like a nightmare. They did, they did. And yeah. All of that, and then we were not in compliance with the minute. And the so the block schedule, it never really worked ideally the way we wanted it. That great money I, would, I would I would say money wise as far as giving them the staff they needed they, they made it work uh, but at some point we had to figure out a model to add them to give them staff and like for example Southwest High School where they didn't grow as much or actually may decrease a little bit because of cast and other things they should lose teachers but you don't want to take teachers home because they're trying to, to work through the schedule. Uh, so now that we have this model in a seven period day, we can really use formulas to, to kind of manage that and not really take a lot from campuses, but also don't have to add much at the same time. Uh, the, the program piece, the CTE, it took us a while to figure it out. It did impact us the first year and a half. Uh, and I think now like, we have a plan to make sure that doesn't happen even in a five period day. Uh, but it, it, did, it was a learning curve for sure. On that. So we're not going to. What you're saying is when we go to the seven period day, we're not cutting staff. We're not I know, but we're not really gonna save money because if we stay in the five block we need more teachers. Yes. Okay. Yes. That means we don't we're not having to cut anything. Right. And cut staff, but at some point we're gonna have to add right. uh, and to really keep up with the schedule and all the things that we're adding to programs and with the, the five period day. And this morning to address the concerns um, from curriculum and instruction, we have the programs presented. So for English, we are going to be blocking in the freshman, where we feel that that's where the most gaps occur between eighth grade to ninth grade. And so then also for CTE, we went back and we presented this morning to senior staff the CT courses that need the 90 minutes, and then we have some CT courses that are only 45. So for CTE, you know, both those both concerns have been also brought to the table. And we created some lock schedules of if we were to go to seven period day, 
how is that going to impact and how can we move forward when making the decisions that are not going to impact negatively any of the programs in the content as well. What about the dual credit? So because of the start period day and speaking also with PAC, most of the districts around the districts also follow the start period model. And last week being on a phone call with most of the districts on the phone call, but most of them are opting now to do now the start period day. The only one that's not doing start period is doing an AP is Randall. But they have like 400 kids on their campus. So for cost purposes at the same time, and we're going to be doing dual credit, although out the way our external partners, they're also working with our bell schedule. So our bell schedule will be con concise with the surrounding districts and also amongst our districts. So, and I want to clarify too, when we talk about we're going to double one, 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 two, it's not all students. So uh, but it's definitely those students that we identified who have that need to, to add more time. And it's really unique. And so it's an ELR block, and then the next uh, English block is really Three. specific. So the kids that need the differentiated learning are going to get it in, in, in an extended block. Correct. By the other students who are really going to advance and advance, the greater will be in the PAP hours. And some of these courses come already with a criteria. So for dual credit, have some do have with many criteria. The 250 periods together, CT the 250 periods together. So for that, we will still be able to do all that when we're going to So we're essentially in a, going to be in a hybrid, not yeah. in either or. Okay. Thank you. What is a DMB local? DMB local is a local policy that speaks uh, specifically to uh, administration, I believe, fiscal evaluations. And uh, Mr. Rinker and Joanne have been. Uh, working in the uh, leadership realm of the district and trying to refine that and take a much way that in the district uh, instrument uh, to evaluate our principles and that has to be approved by the board. So I believe Mike, with Mr. Rinker, is going to bring us the first meeting of the DNB local uh, and the board and the rate of production uh, issue. Good evening, Mr. Uh, uh, so I'm going to read uh, our proposed change to DMB local, and then we also added in your packets uh, uh, our kind of our administrative guidelines that we're going to have in regards of uh, for more. The district shall appraise principles using a local appraise process developed in accordance with law and administrative regulations. Other campus administrators, campus administrators, other than principals shall be appraised local appraise process determined by each administrator's position and job responsibilities and developed in accordance with law and administrative regulations. Frequency, district principals, and other campus administrators shall be appraised annually. Thank you. Sounds and, good. Uh, I believe I think that uh cover J and I just exit out here. State waiver. Uh, I would say probably like ninety five percent of all Texas ISD because of this. We're moving to an emergency virtual platform, uh, some things weren't able to happen. And so, uh, PTA put together a process the districts go through to get uh, those uh, kind of expectations uh, requirements waived for this year. Okay, so, on May 5th, um, TA went ahead and published this waiver. So, we did not administer the ASVAP to cast it. So, this is what we requested the waiver, and we went ahead and started the process after we. And so the waiver has been approved, and so we went ahead and used the resolution that was given to our superintendent for him to make these decisions for us. So it's good news to us that we've been able to move forward with this waiver. And the same thing happened with our um, CPR. We had our kids that did not complete that requirement for our senior class. And so we have um, the same thing for 
normally in our senior class, they go ahead and complete that requirement, whether it's through the health class, or if not, they complete that on their senior day. So this is another expectation that, another requirement that we're not going to be able to fulfill due to COVID. So that waiver has also been approved. Curiosity. Does that mean our students are being allowed to learn the military without the or do they have to take So it? these are only the sophomores that are past and currently. I had the same PR waiver. Uh, the CPR. I just did. Yeah, yeah the CPR waiver was basically the same. Uh, we have a requirement where uh, the four students leave the in the years that they uh, have a CPR uh, training, you know, because of the mass interruption, we can complete that. So we can go under the monitor and allow them to cover two at one time. We stuck it in there, so commencement report. Yes, so um, I know we have our high school principals. We've got only here from time as well yes. as uh, uh, Landon and uh, Joanne. We have some uh, districts in the district. Our principals represent their campuses. Um, as all of you know, some flexibilities uh, have been given to uh, school districts in the state of Texas uh, to uh, conduct uh, restricted uh, outdoor uh, commencement uh, events. And, uh, so, after a lot of dialogue and conversation, uh, we put together a task force of about uh, 40 to 50 people. Uh, we've been working on this uh, for approximately three weeks, uh, or two to three weeks. I know we've been at the football fields uh, yesterday morning uh, for a couple hours each field that have kind of over and just didn't, didn't happen. So uh, what we like to do tonight is to bring the board uh, our best thinking because yesterday the governor's uh, meeting, a press conference, uh, there were additional flexibilities uh, that are extended uh, that allow some face-to-face opportunities. We're not really bringing that to, to the board tonight, uh, but we know that uh, because of that, we have some things within our plan uh, that we've changed. And so what we're bringing tonight is definitely not our final plan, but where we are today, where thinking is today, when we expect to get uh, information and communication uh, out there families. I know when uh, we put the video out, there's a lot of excitement around and the kids are excited, uh, but it's incumbent upon us uh, as well, and we take that charge, we don't take it lightly. Uh, but uh, we'll turn over to Brandon and then pass the principals uh, to Brandon and Joanne again. Thank you, sir. Uh, just so briefly, we have a, a plan that we're going to follow. Uh, we have a really good team working through all the, uh, the processes of getting this thing. It's, uh, it's a big event for us, and so that means that we have some, uh, I don't say obstacles, but we the safety part of this is what's a major impact in driving a lot of the things that we're trying to plan. And so we've created a, a really some team leaders to deal with some of the things that we logistically have. Uh, and so really for the, the actual graduating of ceremonies, uh, our fabulous principals here will talk a little bit about what they're doing, but they, they, they're controlling that. Usually when we go to the elbow they take care of all that. And uh, some team leaders on our staff that handle graduation. So the running show is really being handled by the, the campuses and led by the principals. Uh, we do have some uh, logistical uh, things that we're going to work through, like parking uh, and keeping people safe in our parking lots and, and making sure that uh, we have, just like you told the Ella Dome, you know what lot you're parking in, what gate you're going in, and what section you're sitting in. So we're working uh, with each group. Uh, and that group that's leading the parking area is obviously our chief. Uh, he's putting all of his business together for that. Uh, entry and exit strategies, uh, the entry gates and, and working with exiting, Mr. Figueroa uh, is going to be working on those. He's also going to be working on contingency plans. If we have rain or thunderstorms or power outages, and so we'll have a incident command team ready to go to deal with any issues that we face on that night. Uh, and dealing with just keeping people safe as far as hydrated uh, in, in those scenarios. Uh, Coach Wagner will be leading the ushers for our audience because part of getting into the, once we have a part and get them into the right gate, we're going to have assigned seating. Uh, and Coach Wagner will be running the ushers uh, and making sure that people get to the right location and sitting in the right areas so that we don't have people on top of each other and, and using 
but all the social distancing practices. Uh, communication department, public relations is a, is a whole team effort there, led by Jesse, uh, communicating itself. One of our best friends at this whole event will be communication, so that people know exactly what we're doing, so there's no surprises when they show up. And then uh, Thomas and Alfiel, we're really working on the operations plan, uh, looking at the PCAD or the CAD of the stadium, the parking lot, putting all the maps together, and then getting the place ready. You know, we haven't really touched it in a long time. We haven't been down to football fields, we mow it, but we haven't been enough down there to get ready to we went for our football season. So it's a lot going into and just getting all the facilities ready. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Black. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yes. Can yes, we get a spray from the studio? We can. I mean, I'm thinking that we should probably spray. I don't know how long it lasts, but yeah. we don't want to kill our people. Okay. I'll talk to Tom too, and I don't really especially, uh, but we are going to work that week diligently on everything down there and getting the field ready, getting sanitized uh, the day before, and that's something that we run the water. Yeah. Go ahead. The Mr. President, board members, uh, strange setting we're in, but we're here, so we're going to do the best we can and make the best of it. So, there's been some overall plans, uh, legacy plan, and Southwest plan are very, very similar, but just of so the two stadiums make some tweaking here and there. But the overall all ground ceremony. Cannot hear anything. Guidelines that were changed. One message went out first, and then the guidelines were lifted a little bit on some things or tweaking some things. So the graduates are going to receive four tickets. Uh, they're also going to get two parking passes. Uh, the audience team will be assigned and randomized by zone. So there'll be color coded zones that they'll receive, in which if their student is in zone A, then they'll also be in zone A. So that way they'll be in close to the proximity to where their student is. So that see and, and be pretty close to the scene there. But if we get those in packets, we'll have, we'll have some costs for our seniors to come by the schools and pick up their packets so that we build in that packet will be uh, the program so we'll have less hand to hand exchange uh, so they already have their packets, they'll have their tickets, they'll have their parking passes, It'll, all the instructions will be in there. What basically our, our, our student guidelines are as far as graduation goes and some of the other things that will be in that packet. Um, the entrance, both of them will be staggered entrances, so we'll start about 6.45 to 7.15, start and 17 letting people in. There will be two different entrances, um, and then parking is going to be in designated zones to match it. So everything will be color coded. They'll be parking in a color code area, they'll sit in a color code area, and the student will be in a color code area, so it'll all kind of match up. Uh, this person has done a great job as far as putting together all those kinds of items. Uh, tickets will be included in your message will also be your COVID 19 guidelines. Of course, those are changing daily. So, we're going to do the best we can to include whatever guidelines those are at the time. Um, Safety is going to be limited, and we're going to try to use our social distancing and proximity there. Uh, ceremony is going to begin at approximately, well, promptly at 8 o'clock. Uh, we'll be live streaming and recording as well. Too. We're also going to have two large uh, jumbotrons there so that see. Able to see depending upon how far away from the stage you show them should have that uh, advantage as well. Uh, then we'll have audience and graduate exits uh, staggered so we're not all exiting at the same time, so we have large clusters of people in one time. That. So, so that's the overall plan. Mr. Gibbard's going to go over the safety protocols. Good evening. Yes, sir. So on the safety floor, so I know that all the committees really came together because that was the most important piece, obviously. We want to make sure that we honor our kids. We also want to make sure that we maintain safe everybody from students, from parents, and communities, everybody being part of the project. So first things first, as we know, hand sanitizing stations at designated areas throughout the state. So there'll be sanitizing stations throughout the area. Everywhere it'll be um, on the field, um, on the track, and the bleachers. So we'll have access to that. 
as Coach Black mentioned, we're going to continue social distance. We'll be social distance ambassadors. We'll be on site to help monitor physical distance requirements. So we'll have we'll have folks up on the stadium, making sure everybody is still six feet apart um, when they sit down. We guess same thing with students on the ground or the stadium on the on the, uh, on the field. They will also be staggered six feet apart. So that that's not going to change. Um, face masks will be provided highly recommended. So we'll provide face masks to all the students um, to get folks up in the bleachers. We're going to highly encourage that they, they wear their masks. Um, CDN has been marked to ensure that each group has adequate space. So we, we've sent out surveys to kind of get an idea of how many uh, guests we can expect. We're kind of going based off that. But based on the way we're able to, to navigate how we're going to see the, the guests, we think we're going to be able um, physical contact between graduates and district officials will be limited by placing the phones in the podium. So as the students, typically what we do is we give the phone to the student, we shake their hand, we're not doing it. We don't do any kind of hand-to-hand -hand contact. So on the actual podium itself, so the phones will be there in case we grab it. And once they walk off the stage, we'll take their picture. Um, communication. So strong communication plan will be present throughout the facility on safety protocol. So throughout the entire ceremony, we'll be making we'll be saying those reminders of making sure that they maintain social distance, making sure that they're not um, being where they're not supposed to be. It's going to be a very strict um, event. Portable restrooms or cooling panels for heat will be on site as well too. So you know at Legacy, we've got one set of restrooms on one side, so we're going to bring in portable restrooms for that as well. We know it's going to be hot, so we'll also be bringing cooling fans for these kids as well. Tents for emergency will be on site as well, too. Uh, we'll have first aid and EMS will be on site at both locations, at both, so both, both stadiums on each side of the field. Very good. So, are the students RSVP or are you guys going to or are you asking them to commit either way, whether right. they're coming yeah. or not? We created a survey and sent it out. And uh, basically, I got some generic information for the students and then asked them to first read some of the guidelines that we initially put out. Mm -hmm. um, and then once they read that, just respond, yes, you read the guidelines. And the next question is, are you able to abide by the guidelines and participate or do you decline to participate? Right now, as when I left the office, we had 365 uh, surveys returned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 355, yes. Approximately 440. Oh, we sent out survey. 440. 440. Times 4. So, in what? So, when we, so we're getting this from the kids, but do we, like, make sure that the parents are involved in that? Correct. Yes, and even before we even treaded on this venture, we sent a survey to both parents and students and what would they prefer? A virtual waiting until July or going currently with what we could do at our own savings. And the overall response was that they prefer to do something at our own savings. You know, at the end, how at the at the stadium, there's always like this mob of, of kids and parents, and they're looking for each other, and it's just like crazy, like thousands of people. How how are we gonna like mitigate that? Or how? What are we so I know we leave this mess at the end. Those people from the stadium that's gonna bring in this mess. That way, it's not just a, just a few kids at a time. Okay. So we'll be we'll be exiting this. So we're gonna have it. it sell, how'd you come in? So where you park? To where gate you go in? To what? We're going to have the, the ushers and the social distance ambassadors. That's how we're going to exit them. We're going to do roll at times at different, all four sections of the stadium, going different directions up the same gate you came in and to the same parking lot. And then we will walk the students through their gates the same as the designated parking lots. We are still working through a lot of the logistical piece. We're going to meet tomorrow. We're walking, talking about parking. And so on the district side, we're going to try to handle that and mitigate that. We are a little worried about you know, the parking lot. Like once they get in the parking lot, but at the same time they're with their parents. So we encourage the parents to be in their cars Correct. and the kids to get in their Correct. cars. And, and so that's going to be our messaging. That's where the communication piece comes in. But really getting that communication out. This is our expectation, even at the end when it's time to leave. And hopefully they want to go to wherever event they have after because it's graduation night that they would abide by that. And so we're going to continue to look at it, plan it, 
It's not going to be perfect. We know we're going to run into hiccups, but we have contingencies, and, and, and hopefully we have enough people to help just get through. Because uh, we want, it's about the kids. We just want to put the, the show on for them and let them graduate. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to deal with any crises or any issues as we go and try to be as accommodating as possible at the same time and follow all the safety guidelines that, uh, that we have in place. So we have the exiting piece is something we're still trying to work on and, and work out. Uh, and we'll update you all as we get closer to a finalized plan. But, all right. We've we kind of been very clear before, during, and after. Of course. We know we're not going to have a hundred percent. A lot of us, I think everyone in here is dealt with large crowds, especially when we get excited. We do have a plan to create uh, some things that maybe grab their attention. Yeah. Um, so we're working on that, like at the end of the ceremony. Uh, where what are the health precautions we're talking about? And we know students like to throw their hat. And if we throw them a hundred times, not to throw their hat. Mm -hmm. I promise you, they're going to throw their hat. Mm -hmm. So we're coming up with a plan when that happens. Uh, I don't know if we found a second hat or what our plan. We're in the process, but we're you know we want them to throw at just don't pick up at. Oh, if you're not with you, uh, we'll deal with it like that. So we're we're going through the program uh, frame by frame by frame, uh, and uh, we'll leave money to go for great solutions. And yeah, yeah, they have to be confident in that you will do it correctly. It's time to do this. It's time. Yeah. Yes, we have confidence. Yeah. 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 Yes, we have confidence that the very best of your ability. Yeah, we have 50 people working on it, so I think we're all fine. Any more questions on graduation? And that's where we they probably lost it. And uh, some flexibility. I, I don't think these flexibilities will still be here in July, so I think this outdoor ceremony is our best opportunity. Um, and we're going to move forward and do the best we can to keep everyone safe. I think our parents understand the environment. I think they're going to be very good. That's what we're going to explain to them. What we need to talk here. Okay. I think our parents are super excited because most of them are alumni. Most of them are graduating on the field. Oh, yeah. They're really excited. On the Facebook page, we're now announced. I mean, they're excited. Our parents are like, oh. Yeah. They will be, if we have to delay it, I mean, we are renting a lot of things, jumbotrons and, uh, you know, the chairs and a lot of dirt, you know, the different things. Uh, so the next, if it's going to be quick, if we have a good turnout, I mean, it looks a little different. Uh, but our own chairs and our own no jumbotron, but if we wait a couple weeks, that's all we have to discuss. We're going to go with plan, but that looks like Ready to go on to phase two return to work? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's uh, so previously on free break, we had thought we had a kind of a phase, phase home plan. So we had a, a kind of a four phase plan to get uh, people working remotely and getting people safe uh, from the COVID virus. And now we're on kind of the downside, you know, uh, just we've been following our local officials and our governor's uh, ordinance and the, the things that come out with the governor. Uh, and so the, we know the local ordinance is uplifted and the governor is starting to open up in more capacity. So we have been working on planning and phases to get people acclimated back to work in different type of environments. And so we were currently in a phase three uh, last week where it was very limited. Uh, we had a very limited staff here. You only came up if you had to pick something up or take care of business. Uh, as of May 18th, we moved into a phase two which is more of a blended staggered environment where we have uh, a, a few people working in a blended environment. They're working maybe two days here in, in the office, and if they can work at home, you know, they can follow and make sure they're working at home and doing their, their work. And really, teachers are more like maybe they come in and clean their room and they, they can work from home because we know they're doing work from home. Uh, but for the rest of the district, it's uh, a blended environment. Maybe they're working remotely a couple days, and a couple of days here, they're physically. We're also staggering schedules where people aren't here at the same time. And some are coming a little earlier, some are coming a little later. Uh, we do have a lot of employees that can't work remotely, uh, like our you know, facilities and maintenance and our ground crew and, and, and different groups. They are working more of three days on right now uh, until we get closer into maybe uplifting into a phase four. We are clocking in using our frontline system. The new system allows us to clock in from anywhere. Uh, so that's how we're able to track time. 
uh, and it's really just working with everybody, making sure we're still following the protocols, using the social distancing as we're opening up restaurants and businesses. Uh, everybody knows that you have to practice all these things, and we're practicing the work. But what we call sneeze guards, we put in all offices. If you walk over in Linda, she has this sneeze guard plastic thing that protects people, and you know, we're asking people to wear masks when they're within meetings and with more people, uh, so that people can be safe. Uh, so we have a kind of a phase two plan it goes through and this is a document you, it's you have it with you and we send out to all the employees kind of explaining uh, some of the rules some of the things that they should be looking for uh and for the most part i think everything is going really well um, we haven't had a whole bunch of complaints or issues if we do we kind of deal with those on a one-to-one -one basis uh and and on our campuses it's a little bit more limited uh they're bringing people in really right now for campuses it's close out this is like if you a business is like the close out of the of a business year for the school day for the schools it's like getting teachers in clean their rooms out and pick up their stuff because teachers haven't been allowed to come in there since like spring break so a lot of them have been back to get in there to get their supplies or get their stuff that they left in their in their rooms and so for teachers it's really they're really working remotely but they're coming in and wait like sections principals have them come in in sections so that they can clean their rooms and get what they need uh and make accommodations for next year uh, and, and then this will evolve into a phase one where we're completely back. Uh, I can't tell you when that is. Uh, and, and as senior leadership looks and as we get more information from our officials you know, in the government, uh, we'll make that decision and bring it back to y'all and let you know where we are. But that's kind of where we are in current state. Uh, and it's just really trying to get back into the physical work environment, but also maintaining social distancing. And, and if people can work well, from home remotely, we are advocating for that as long as we know that the work is done. So I don't know if there's any questions on that piece. Did we decide at the summer program that we have for kids that we decide to move both windows or not? Like, I know not the, the necessary ones, I guess. Those we decided to move forward with, like, on campus or remotely? Yeah, so the new information uh, has flexibility to speak face to face. We had a really long discussion in our Fair County Superintendent's meeting this morning about what that means and what that looks like that we were offering to people. What we're looking at right now, and it'll be uh, a drawback uh, coming up in the framework, is because we, we can do some uh, controlled face to face opportunity, and uh, there's a lot of nervousness about doing that for, for not only the children, but for some of the adults. Uh, is what I've just planned out is we'd like to create some recovery of credit, a lab opportunity for students who didn't get their high school credit, but they can continue. So immediately after this school year is complete, we'll open up some labs, do some kind of controlled environments, uh, maybe my schedule. Uh, it definitely gives us an opportunity to apply the social protocols and to uh, how, how to lift the students down the hallway. Uh, we obviously have seven things today that we're going to start meeting on is, is what does it look like beyond summer school and so we're going to talk about that when we get to the later part of june we are believing we consider our traditional summer school opportunity uh i mean believe the majority at this point in time today the majority of what we're going to be doing is on a virtual platform uh, but we'd like to use that time to pilot some uh, small uh, face opportunities specifically uh, addressing uh, some of our, our special education uh, extended year service uh, students and uh, early childhood education uh, to try to mitigate some of those uh, reading gaps that uh, may be their their students for their head. And then maybe some other things, uh, but leaving our probably our middle school and other high school students uh, in a virtual platform. And then maybe do uh, what we're looking at to start next year. And it's taking that two week window where we normally have a lot of onboarding activities and move that down to two days for adults and then start school around August 10th, which is what everyone's looking at. Uh, not extending the, the year, but using that time frame in there to cut the year one goes in. And see how, what we can do in July, who's most things in July so that we can get in earlier next year. If we start in that environment. And we may have a staggered calendar. Uh, to apply the rules to a 72 passenger bus 
it looks like most students and white truck drivers would be in that capacity. So that's really kind of a, a scary thought. So we are, we're deciding to put off through June and see what uh, EDA comes up with and what the numbers look like and uh, what the flexibilities might be there. Do you know if uh, most school districts are, what are they doing? Do you know what that means? Uh, having the same conversations we're having. Uh, everyone's kind of fluid right now. So uh, we're talking about it uh, next year. Uh, everyone's looking at you know, the same funded format. Those students who work virtually, uh, those teachers who love working virtually, want to care about it. Um, they kind of keep that going virtually. Not going to come back like we traditionally do. Those students who need maybe a day or two on the school, they're on that rounding uh, with a teacher. But they can't work virtual outside of that. Kind of stuff, you know. Some schools are doing Monday Wednesday uh, with the group of students. 25% uh, capacity. 25% capacity here. School guys are all fine right now. Uh, and then a the different group Tuesday and Thursday. And then we do Friday and Friday do some enrichment uh, or some meal opportunity with the students. So it's going to be a, a kind of a story story of different things happening everywhere. So we're definitely getting into conversations. Uh, we have a good conversation. If we did have a plan, I would change it quick. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. programmatic needs at um, Southwest Legacy High School. We are uh, coming to you for renovation of an existing science lab and classroom to serve as a cosmetology lab and instructional classroom uh, to equate that of Southwest um, High School at Southwest Legacy. Uh, the pricing was procured through our IDQ pre-approved uh, general contractors. The advertisement was sent on April 15th and bids were received on May 5th. We received three um, bids that are, are listed on your packet. MLP Ventures uh, came to the lowest price. We had already done the vetting on the pre-approved for uh, all the qualifications. So this one is uh, pretty much strictly on, on price. The fiscal impact would be of 182,000. $726, and this will come out of 2012 bond funds. Our recommendation is that the board approve MLP Ventures as a general contractor for Southwest Legacy Cosmetology Renovation in the amount of so, um, let's see here. So this year we are doing our textbook adoption for the high school ELAR. Last year we went ahead and adopted the kinder through eighth grade uh, textbooks for ELAR. So we went through a process and there was some campus leads. We made sure enough voice from our ELAR department. So we had some leads, which were the department heads from each of the high schools. We started the process back in February. So we went ahead and contacted all the vendors that were interested in this process and all of April due to COVID, all of the rest of the work happened virtually. The good thing about this is that this allowed for teachers to have more voice. So in the end, each teacher was able to participate as far as the textbook committee. 
And we did get out of the 35 eligible teachers, 28 at the end cast their vote. So in the end, they went ahead and voted on May the 6th for a Perfection Learning Corporation. So this is what we're bringing before you to approve. And here are the, the survey that we went ahead and sent out to the teachers. So these are our four vendors. Uh, last year, the company that they had was Pearson, which is what they're familiar with. But it's the green, which is Perfection Learning, what they've decided to vote for and move forward with. So we are asking the board to approve for us to move forward with adopting um, this state board adoption for ELAR, for a high school ELAR. Mm -hmm. So the next item, I don't have my, the agenda with me. Which is our next item? <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. So we have been coming to the board, um, just taking you through the process of what we had to create. And this is mainly the board adopting and approving some of the percentages for three different distinct areas. So when we presented this to you, it was mainly the process. And what we went back is we made sure that we had voice from the principals down to even our district improvement committee. Um, our district improvement team. So we presented this plan to the district improvement team back on May the, um, April the 26th actually. And so everybody has had enough voice. The purpose of this is for us to be moving through the individual targets. Uh, the portion at the bottom is closing the gaps. There's 13 targets and we're looking at different ethnicity groups and at the same time, special population groups. So for the most part, after looking at several models across the state, we were looking at our base model. So here, what we're looking at is the meets, the meets level. It's not just the approaches if they're passing or almost meeting, but this is meets level. And so our district has been, we're looking at increasing from 36% in over five years to 50%. So for the most part, we're looking at almost a two to 4% increase every single year. So after we set the base year target goal, then we have to go back and look at these individual groups, which are 13 groups that we have to be constantly monitoring. And this pretty much mirrors a lot of our new accountability system that before it was just, you passed the grade level and we were good with a whole group, but now we have to be looking at the 13 specific ethnicity with special population groups. So it's gonna be a challenge, but the good thing is that we have a lot of the work that is being um, geared towards this. So this is just one a goal that we do have the literacy that later on we have to come back and share with you year after year how we are having progress towards these goals. So we will be coming back to you at the beginning of the year to let you know, or at the end of the year to let you know how we are doing as a district and then campuses individually are gonna have to create these same goals. So if you look at the yearly target goal, you look at almost 2% increases, which is from 46 all the way to 56, how do we get there? So it's a measurable, um, attainable goal that we are uh, trying to achieve. So we're looking at early childhood, and I know there's different numbers, and we give this part of the packet. So we wanted to just let you know that there's been a lot of voice um, that we have been carrying through to make sure that we are all united in this and that our work is gearing towards this uh, type of improvement. So I know in kinder through, this is even pre-K work, is going to be essential. Kinder work, first grade, second grade, in order for us to be making these measurable goals and all the way to third grade. So not only are we looking at early childhood, we're also literacy, but we're looking at math, the same process. We had to create yearly target goals, and then we also had to come back and create these measurable goals that we're gonna come back and share with you as a board. So these templates are going to become very familiar to all of us in the room, because we're gonna be sharing this information to the board as well. So again, I don't wanna go into the detail of the percentages down to the groups, but is a yearly, the yearly target goal along with the 13 indicators at the bottom. So we're looking at literacy, we're looking at math, and we're also looking then at the high schools, which is the CCMR. So I know that in the past, this has been the area that you know has been, especially this year, we started really good and really strong with creating some really good outcomes for our CCMR goal. And so now this is something that the state is also requesting and asking for us to it. So um, after today, we're going to ask the board to approve our goals. And then from here, we're gonna go back and present the final goals to the campuses. And then the campuses will come back and create the similar templates with their goals individually. But in the end is we wanna make sure that as a district, individual campuses are increasing 
And so we want to make sure that we get towards these goals by the end of the five years. So I'm going to ask for the board for your approval on this data that has been presented to you. Thank you. Um, I believe the next curriculum. So due to the new textbook, and we also had some ELRTs that changed. The ELRTs changed two years ago, and so this was the first year that the teachers did really teach with the new ELRTs. But now that we have a new textbook and new ELRTs, we are coming to the board because we need some curriculum writing again. So for some contents, we are not asking for curriculum writing to start from the initial stages of curriculum writing. For some contents, all we need is for us to go back and just do some tweaking and some adjustments to that. I do want to plot the work of the content of, of the team and CNI because some of these, in the past, we had purchased and outsourced, which we call TCMPC, a Texas resource management system. And so what we've been able to do inside the content team is they've been ahead and they've customized and they've added some additional documents in order for the teachers to understand how do you use this particular TEAC or learning standard and how do you accommodate that with the resources that we are purchasing? So based on we have new resources and the one that we just approved right now, we are asking for a stipend um, for the teachers for them to be able to help us through this work. So because we are blended, uh, in the past we used to pay them by hour. They used to come in and we would see them and we would take them to the work. Now since we're in this blended model, we are now asking for a stipend for them to complete a, an assignment for them to complete the project. We are still gonna have the virtual meetings happening, but we're gonna be coaching them through the final product that we want. So we're gonna pay them for a project, for a product versus by hour. So we are asking for the board to approve for this work. Thank you. So I do appreciate the work of Mr. Figueroa, and it was almost like a blended work of a lot of people. Um, but due to COVID, and I know we're going to continue hearing that, we did have a, a good group of here, along with our administrators from the, each campuses. We want to make sure that we had enough voice. GPA is a huge issue, and we want to make sure that we were protecting our students moving forward due to the situation that they were a part of. So we had a good GPA task force having these conversations, and I appreciate also um, you know, Dr. Faye in this work because it really did have to be a lot of cross teaming and making sure that we were listening to all the voices. So part of the work was just making sure that we looked at the guidelines and the resolutions from even different districts. How are different districts moving along? And just like Dr. Verso shared, as we have been moving along into this unprecedented uh, situation that we're in, we were making sure that we were uh, listening to other districts and not wanting to hurt the kids in every in any decision that we would take. Um, so what we've done is we've met with everyone. We've also had a TASB review. Uh, we've also met with curricula meetings with Region 20 just to make sure like how are different districts moving forward. And so in the end, our resolution is a copy that has been handed to you. And we are basically going to, um, what it states there, and I, I don't have access here. I think it's your, I don't know if you can pull it up, but. What we are asking is for us to continue with the first and second nine weeks grading cycle. And we are also going to use that first semester as an average. The third nine weeks is going to be the only nine weeks that we're going to use for the second semester. Because when we entered into the fourth weeks, the fourth nine weeks, that's when we went on remote. So because we went to remote, not every single student had the same, uh, the same facility, um, the same access to whether it was written packets, uh, paper packets, or remote. And this is basically what other school districts also opted to do. So we are asking for the board to approve uh, this new GPA calculation only for the graduation cohorts of 2021, 2022, 2023, and 2024 that is going to impact, which is our current kiddos other than the seniors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just uh, I want to thank everyone. Uh, um, I know people think it may be easier because kids are coming. We've really gotten a lot harder in the last nine weeks. 
doing some different work that I think uh, we haven't done before, but we can do it. I really appreciate the work, uh, support and flexibility. Uh, one conversation we had in our seniors past meeting this morning was uh, uh, kind of a change. Uh, we were uh, anticipating collecting all the devices that we have out in the homes. Uh, really about the fact that there's a new TDA University program uh, that we can work with our parents uh, and keep our kids reading as opposed to kind of bring those devices in. But if, if any of you have any concerns about that, it's actually connected to me individually. Uh, of this, we didn't make an agenda item, but our, our intention is to come up with a way to get a kind of inventory that by having the parents on the board that says where they keep this, where we use it, uh, they work on this. Cyber trade well, it has a more trading that you have announced. Hey, we have to pay for that, right? Yeah. We're we're uh we're part of the co-op, so we don't have to. There's no charge for us. But I also heard that summer leadership is going on online, for, right? Yes, that's different. But these are required. These are required for the board members. Some of them are the every two years. You know, in some. The ones that I start by, mm -hmm. those are the ones um, you guys are required to take. So there's the date, and uh, attached to that is um, the ones for, it tells you what you're required every year, and what can you do every two years, and if you're a new board member. Yeah. But this is what we need to take. You all need to take the uh, Senate Bill 1566, and you all need to take the human trafficking. So there's the dates when you... Just let me know so you can register. Thank you. Just apply for a waiver. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is on the internet. Again, just like yes, sir. Just like the other one. Just listen to the other one. Yes. So whenever y'all get a chance, just email me or text me or whatever. Whenever y'all decide to make your schedules. We're expecting information from you all to be coming out next week. Uh, uh, what? Yeah, some of the weight programs and a bunch of clubs and activities that involve you might all uh, not ready to make a decision if I have to take more direction to there. Uh, well, we might be doing some summer camps here. I think our board soccer team would want to take camps this year. They were 15 and 0. Our soccer coach is going to take a lot of people. Coach of the year. They, they, they out and scored all their opponents. Four opponents. Four opponents. 217 or something. Yeah, we're, we're getting the state ring anyway. I think they go over there. Yeah. I think more people want to go over there. Anybody else have anything? Oh. All right, what time is it again? 
7. 7.54, we go. 